Lance Pendleton. He is the partner of Good Sphere and former national head of agent strategy of Compass. Let me tell you, a couple of weeks, few weeks ago, I had an interview with Lance and it's an amazing personality, Lance. Here is the compliment in front of all our audience um, and wealth of knowledge and the knowledge that you don't really meet every day. It's completely different approach, different point of view. So please ask questions and listen carefully. So here is Lance. How are you, Lance? Good. And you, I think you had a change recently, didn't you? Yeah, we just, thank you, Lance. We just uh, uh, joined Metaport team. So we are Meta, Metaportians. Uh, there, there is a special terminology for that. We are very excited about that. And please note there is a $99 special for Metaport and floor plan with unlimited square footage. So there is no discrimination how big or small the property is. You get a really cool, uh, cool product. So please make sure that you take advantage of it. It's uh, it's good for the for another couple of months, uh, and there is no promo code. All you have to do is just place an order. And we are very excited to be part of Metroport. It's really great for VHT Studios to be part of an uh, organization that is so well known and well established, publicly traded. So yes, it's a good thing for us. And uh, we are looking forward to that relationship. It only happened last week. And now, uh, like it's really the very first week that we are in business together. So so thank you, Metaport, for taking us to your family. So here, let's start with the show. So let's, let's start with what Good Sphere is all about and how, uh, how you were able to apply your experience and your work experience, your life experience to, uh, to the and, and your whole background to what you are doing today and how you are helping agents. Yeah. So first of all, thank you for having me. It's, it's always a pleasure talking to you. And I know you and I go way back. So it's, uh, it's great to see you again. Um, and Kate, I feel like we go back as well, too, even though I just met you. Um, I am, um, I love this cause I can say anything to Kate. She literally can't say anything back to me. It's fantastic. Hopefully she can't type horrible things about me in chat. Um, I, yeah, so just a quick background on me for those of you that have never met me yet. Uh, again, my name is Lance Pendleton. Um, I am formerly the, uh, was the head of national agent development, uh, for Compass, uh, up until about a month ago. Prior to that, um, I was the chief innovation officer for the largest Sotheby's realty affiliate in the U S uh, many moons ago, I worked for Apple in helping uh, their retail employees understand how do you explain technology to people who do not care about technology, which I always laugh and say is probably my greatest qualification to work with agents. Um, but I, uh, my background's in behavioral psychology and the science of well-being. And about a year and a half ago, um, uh, two partners and, and myself got together and realized that the landscape of how agents get support and how agents... Um, really understand how to operate better inside of the business and the changing landscape of the business was kind of dysfunctional. Um, and so as Lucy, you, you know, you and I have talked a lot about this um, and I'll get into the theory, but we, we founded a company called Good Sphere um, and Good Sphere's principal process is to help agents understand how do you build healthier, better relationships? And in that, how do you understand how to do what's the smallest, simplest thing that you can be doing each day in 15 minutes or less that has the highest return on your investment for that time, both personally and professionally. So we really are a blend of looking at both how your personal life and your business life are deeply enmeshed. And we work to try and improve the quality of both at the same time by how you connect to people, engage with people and, and drive and grow your business while also understanding that you, the parts that you love about what you do really are what make you great at what you do. So, um, this is, uh, we, I'm happy to sort of expand if you want, Lucy, on like where philosophically the idea came from and how we think. Is that, would you like me to go into that? Yes, I, I think so. I think it's a good idea. Thank you. So I, and, I, and I'm sure sometimes I either, whenever I explain this, sometimes I, I'm curious to see who sends hate mail because I, <laughs> as, I, as Lucy set you up, my, my beliefs and my philosophical approach are very different than normal. Um, and that's from years of having studied um, as I said, human behavior, how we exist, how we uh, connect to people, what the fundamentals of how we engage with people in a healthy way and what that looks like. Um, and so when I, when my partners and, and myself were looking at uh, real estate on a whole, 
Uh, the one thing that we kept recognizing was that the coaching, traditional coaching industry um, was kind of broken. And um, so I want to be super clear, traditional real estate coaching, that's great. It's fantastic. Certain folks thrive in that environment, do really well. And there's a lot of amazing coaches out there. So please don't get me wrong. I'm, I simply believe wholeheartedly that from what I've learned and understood over the years, um, I don't really believe in traditional real estate coaching. And the reason for that is, is that traditional real estate coaching most closely mirrors uh, the healthcare industry. And if you look at the healthcare industry, the healthcare industry is built and designed uh, based off of what we call dependency. So in order for it to be economically successful, curing you doesn't actually really do anything. So what happens in the healthcare industry is, for example, uh, Lucy, you know, if you have high cholesterol and you go to the doctor, the doctor says, great, here's a script, here's a pill that's gonna lower the cholesterol. The problem is no one actually, that's treating a symptom, that's not actually treating the cause. No one sits down with you to go through, well, why is the cholesterol high? You know, what are you eating? How are you exercising? How, what is your stress level like? What are the things that you're doing to manage this process through behavioral things? It's just, here's the script. So what happens is when you stop taking the pill, cholesterol goes right back up again, right? And yes, I know someone's always like, yeah, but there's, you know, certain people have genetic predispositions. Yes, and we've also learned through science that proper eating uh, can also bypass genetic predisposition and dramatically lower it as well. So the point that I'm making is coaching is kind of built around the same model. And what it does is it fosters dependency on the coach for being that script, right? That prescription process. So if I'm struggling in my business and I want to grow my business, or if I'm finding it difficult to uh, engage with people in certain ways, or I'm just not doing as well this year as I may have done last year, you go to a coaching program and that coaching program is going to give you a series, a lot of things that you should be doing. And part of the issue that comes up in this is great. So you start doing those things, but what happens when you do those things, you get busy, right? I mean, you get more business, business comes in, you start doing better, things go great. But what is the first thing you stop doing when things start getting busy? That stuff, you stop taking the pill. So as soon as you stop taking the pill, guess what? Business then drops down again. It goes by the wayside, forcing the dependency back to the coach again for more scripts, more to-dos, more stuff. So what we found and what we believe in wholeheartedly is the idea that what we call living in your good sphere is living in a space and a place in which you have small set, simple things that you do every single day that have the highest income producing return on that time, that through doing those actions in a very small scaled way, we really believe that you can change behaviorally, understanding why that process happens. And in addition, cut down on the freneticness that comes in that wave of like, I get overwhelmed, I get really busy, I stop doing things that are good for me. Business slows down, pipeline dries up, I get super anxious, I start pumping out a bunch of things and start spamming everybody. So Lucy, our, our job is to sort of help shrink the overwhelmed because if you think about the natural process of what happens in coaching, at its core, real estate agents operate right at the intersection of two common reoccurring thoughts, right? The first is, I'm not doing enough. It's the most common reoccurring behavioral thought that an agent has, I'm not doing enough. Followed then by the second most reoccurring common thought is, I'm not enough. Why? Because real estate is built on comparison thinking. What did I do last year? How do I repeat that? What is that person? That person just sent this mailer. How do I send that? This team over here did this. What, what are they doing? How are they getting? What do I do to match that? So when you take I'm not enough and I'm not doing enough and you overlap those like a Venn diagram right in that center is where an agent lives and that's called overwhelmed. And when you're living in that state of overwhelmed, going to someone that's going to say, hey, I'm going to help you improve your business by giving you a bunch of stuff to do doesn't reduce the feeling of overwhelmed. It just makes more and more overwhelmed. So most of you hearing the sound of my voice have consistently had this experience, right? Of which you've gone to some coaching program or a seminar and what? You take a dozen photos of the things that you see on the screen and you're like, I'm going to do this when I get back. And yet, have you ever done it? I'll wait. No one does that. That's not a thing. Why? Because again, it's great in theory, but then life happens. So what we do is we help sort of reset the process a little bit and help you understand that there's really very few things that you need to be doing. And actually by recognizing when you're not doing those, that's how you know you're getting outside of your good sphere and you're kind of drifting away from the core things and components that keep you 
doing things well. And we were also talking about uh, when we met about a month ago, uh, how sometimes that uh, you are very overwhelmed, you are stressed out, you're not doing enough, then you start doing so much like sending thousands of newsletters, emails, uh, begging for business, asking for business, thanking for business, and uh, sending out postcards. And that is also, and then it makes you feel better, but the results are not really there. Yeah. Well, that, that comes from another problem that we have to address and sort of think about and how we change, how we think about operating within the business. Um, because I really believe wholeheartedly that the way that we were all taught the business, right, was uh, different. Let, let's do a panel question. Should we do a panel question? Sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Can we can we get the results? Let's, let's, from let's ask the panel question of, you know, name the, did you attend a real estate university or did you attend or have a degree in real estate or a master's degree at, uh, from a university in real estate? Yeah, that would be interesting to see. While everyone is answering this one, Kate, can you give us results from the previous one about being overwhelmed? You can put it in the chat and I'll read it out. I'm sorry. And I, 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 will, I will tell you that it's unfair because it's a preloaded question. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, I see. Oh, okay. So, of course not. How did we learn the business, right? Well, we learned the business from another agent. And what was that agent's operating state? Guess what? I'm not enough. I'm not doing enough overwhelmed. So what did they actually teach us? Right? They really were learning from somebody else how to operate in a frenetic fashion already because they're saying this is what the business is. This is how you do things. So, you know, Lucy, what I what I like to think about here when you talk about that idea of like, you know, agents get anxious and send things and do stuff. Let's take a step back. Okay. We've always heard that real estate is a relationship business, yeah? It's a relationship, it's easy to say, but think about the fundamentals of human nature and how we operate within a relationship with people. You're operating with somebody at the third most stressful time of their life, right? It used to be fourth, it actually moved up before job loss, believe it or not. Death, divorce, and um, real estate, excuse me, purchase and selling a home is actually, those are your top three. So you're dealing with somebody at the third most stressful time of their life right? And in that process, you're then dealing with them at the third most stressful time in their life with the largest financial asset most people have. Combine those two things together. You run for months and months on end through all of their emotions, right? Their highs, their lows, their marital problems, their financial insecurities, their children, their children's problems. Like you run the gambit of all of the emotional stuff that goes on with somebody during that for months and months on end. At the end, you bring them to the promised land, you bring them to fruition, you get them the thing that they want, you land the plane, they have a fantastic experience with you, you're at the height of trust and success, and what do you do? You put them on a mailing list. Just think about that for a second, because nothing says I hate you more than just shoving somebody on a mailing list. And for what? Kate's laughing because she's like, I know, it's totally true. It, it is, think about, it's probably one of the few things that you could pretty much do that says, hi, I really don't care about you anymore. Because then what is it you start doing to them? And we all like to say we stay in touch. Okay, I'm going to break it to you. Staying in touch is not what ends up happening. My open house, my just sold, coming soon, my new listing, the hot new car to paint your front door in spring, my newsletter, my newsletter. By the way, you haven't opened a thing I've sent you in 12 months. Hey, my newsletter no one gives a crap. I'm just telling you right now. They don't. That's not how human beings operate. We come and we operate from a place of trust. So the idea that we think that we need to be in front of people all the time, right, is not, that's not the way that you go about doing it. And if you think about this concept of like 32 touches, right, that people need to see your name 32 times, Lucy, in order to remember you to want to do business with you, put that into real life, right? Kate, you can't talk, but you can hold up numbers. You ready? If I showed up at your door 32 times a year and rang your doorbell, and when you opened the door, I was like, hey, Kate, I'm in real estate. Just want to let you know. Thanks. Bye. 
How long before you had a restraining order on me? Good, exactly. By the third time, you'd have a shotgun. Let's be clear. That's not how human beings like to be treated, right? So at the fundamental root of relationships and driving good, healthy relationships, when you look at how you generate healthy relationships with people, even when we say we call and reach out to somebody, we always as an agent feel that I have to have something for them. I have to have value for them. I have to have a reason. Otherwise, it's going to seem weird. Well, last time I checked, one human being asking another human being, are you okay? How are things going? How are you? What's new in the world? Does not immediately elicit the response of, I hate you, never reach out to me again. That's not a common thing amongst human beings. Empathy is usually matched with appreciation and kindness because human beings want one of four things, which is to be loved, appreciated, heard, and understood. What they don't want is your newsletter. So what we need to think about is, and I know every time I say this, I told you I'm gonna get hate mail. There's always somebody that's like, oh, my clients love my newsletter. Yes, I'm sure there, again, 4,000 people that you send it to, there's probably 10 or 12, maybe even 50 that are like, that's great, I love this. But what happened to the other 3,950 people, right? We have this thing that we do that we, Lucy, it's called, uh, permanent application, which means that because one person said they liked it, we automatically assume everybody must like it, right? So it's, it's really more about thinking about when we, when we talk about how do we develop healthy relationships, Lucy, it's asking yourself, am I really engaging in a relationship or am I coming from this place of fear and insecurity and anxiety where I'm just like, I need to put stuff out because that stuff that I'm putting out there is going to make people know that I'm confirmed in what I'm doing. Because Fundamentally, real estate as a, as a business model is very, very hard. It's very difficult, not just because of it being an independent function without health care or, con or consistent paycheck. It's very difficult because it's already a, a position, a role, a job that has tremendous amounts of stigma around it, right, from the outside world looking in. And, you know, when you believe that what you do for a living, right, is sort of viewed as something kind of, eh, it's very hard to get up in the morning and not feel like I have to then convince everybody that I'm not that. When the reality of it is, is that at our core, all we should be doing is nurturing people to help them understand that we're guides in a process and that we can be there as a support role for them in that guiding of how they can achieve what they want. Because it's a, it's a we thing not a, I'm the subject matter expert. And Lucy, I know I've shared this with you. Do you know what my least favorite term or saying in real estate is? Oh, let's, ask it. let's put it in the chat, guys. Go ahead. You can drop in chat. When it comes to things that agents say, what is, what is Lance's least favorite saying? And if there's any compass people on, they may have heard me say this before, so they might actually nail this one. I'm not sure. Come on, guys. You're not yeah, they don't need chat. Don't, don't worry about it. I'm, I'm, I'm prattling on, so they don't even need a chat. Here's, here's what I'll say. I'll, I'll give it to you. You ready, Luz? Yep. Thought this information would help you. That's a very good one, Allie. I actually like that one very much. That might, that's my top three. Ready? Mm -hmm. My favorite thing that agents say, which I think is just, I wish no one ever said it again, is the term trusted advisor. Oh, yeah. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. I'm a trusted advisor. If I asked any person on the side of the road right now, what do you think of a real estate agent? Is that person going to turn to me and say, well, my real estate agent is a trusted advisor who helps me with the largest financial. They said no one ever. That's not a thing. That's something that we tell ourselves because it makes us feel good, right? The truth of the matter is if you went into a place to make a purchase, to do any form of transaction, and the first thing that that person said to you was, I'm a trusted advisor. Run for the damn hills, because you know you would. Nobody, nobody, right, is going to come from that perspective. The reality of it is, is that trust is earned. It's not automatically implied because I told you so. And if we have to say it, it may not be true, right? So, you know, it's just thinking about that from a relationship standpoint. And I see that Hugo had a question, but I'll, I, I'm doing a lot of talking, so I'll turn it back to you. Yeah, so there is a question, which is a good question. How do we become healthy agents? Great question. So the very first thing that I always talk about in, in creating health as an agent is to actually look at all of the things that you're currently doing. You literally can make a list 
of all the things that you do daily in all the different forms and functions and be very specific about it, right? What does that mean? It's not just open house. We all know, but what's involved in an open house, right? Printing brochures, putting out signs. You can literally during the course of your day map out all the things that you do as an agent. And then when you're done mapping all those things out that you do, go take a nice big fat Sharpie and draw a line through all the things that you don't really need to be doing. The truth of the matter is, you'll be surprised. Most agents, when I do this exercise with them, about 40% of all the things they do, they don't really need to be doing anymore. When you ask them, well, why do you do it? The answer is like, I don't know. Somebody a while back ago told me that was something I should do. Right? So we're constantly, Lucy, adding things, but we're never removing things, hence the state of overwhelmed. And then we talk about time management. Right? Well, I don't have time to do all these things. Well, you don't have time because you've always been adding and never subtracting. So Hugo, the first thing is take a look at all the things you're doing and begin to eliminate things, right? The second thing is exactly what that poll question is. Ask yourself that question. Am I busy trying to be all things to all people at all times, right? And if the answer is yes, most of the time or always, then you have to reflect on the idea of, is that the healthiest space for me to be living in? And what is it that's driving that? And not to get too deep, but there's an innate form of codependency that we have as agents in which we believe from that place of insecurity that if I don't take that listing at that ridiculous price, something bad's going to happen. They're not going to, I'm not going to get business anymore. If I don't take that phone call at 11 o'clock at night, they're not going to like the service that I provided isn't spectacular, right? If I don't show up at their house while they're on vacation because their ring camera showed that there might be some bird poop on the steps and they're freaking out, and now I got to go drive over there to deal with bird poop on the steps, they're not going to love me anymore, right? This is the nature of where you begin to try and recognize, am I really trying to be all things to all people at all times? And so, Hugo, when you look at those two things, what can I reduce in terms of things that I'm doing that I don't really even know why am I doing them? Seconded then by, am I trying to be all things to all people? What areas does that happen, and how do I shrink that a little bit? You can start to look about gaining some time back and then setting some healthy boundaries around what you can be doing, right? And it's- Look at this link. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just want you to look at the results. I think they're pretty good. Well, not that good of results, right? Well, no, they are good results because you, you actually worded the question differently. The question wasn't, are you okay with not being everything to everyone? Oh, okay. The question is, are you in the process? Many people will feel like I'm okay not being that. I'm doing it anyway, but I'd be okay with not being that way, right? Okay. So it, it really is a, a very different, um, it's a different way of thinking about how do I engage with people. 90% on average of an agent's income, 90%, Lucy, comes from people that they know or people that those people know. Mm -hmm. And when you look at an agent's CRM on the whole, right? Only 10% of an agent's entire CRM actually produces income either directly or because of someone that person knows. And yet you got 4,000 contacts. So what are we trying to do? Everyone's trying to go an inch deep and a mile wide, 32 touches. How do I get all these people? How do I tell you I'm in business? How do I remind you? Here's the hot new color to paint your front door in spring. Here's the local town events. Here's the there are 2.8 million licensed agents in the United States of America. And currently, 90% of all transactions in 2021 were done by only 10% of those licensed agents. Yet, what are all 2.8 million churning out? Stuff for the sake of stuff. And you're trying to differentiate and distinguish yourself by doing what? A different behavior than everyone else that's not doing anything? No. We're trying to distinguish ourselves by doing the same thing that everyone else is doing. So let's, let's get a healthy solution. Uh, and we did have a great question and you answered that. Uh, and the next question would be, what would be the next step for agents to organize? CRM is important. And you were saying that not even everyone has the CRM. Only what, 12% really uh, has their right database. So they, they need to have that to keep track of the past. You have to have some kind of statistics, don't you? Well, you do. And, and I think that, again, a, a client management system, like why don't people use a CRM? Look, most people don't use a CRM because what is it? It's a constant visual reminder 
of what you're failing at. That's what it is. Nobody wants to click a button in the morning and have something pop up and go, oh, I, you know, I'm great. I started my day by reminding myself of all the people that I'm failing with. That's not a thing. Emotionally, nobody wants to do that, right? So the idea here is, you know, if you're going to use a database and use a client relationship management tool, and it's actually a big part of what we work on at GoodSphere, is really understanding where are the only small, that little cluster of people that I really need to be focusing on driving and developing healthier, longer lasting, more meaningful relationships with, <clears throat> excuse me, particularly around the things that I love. And how do I do that in a fashion then that feels more natural to me where then the remaining 90% of folks, I'm like, I don't care about those people. You know, think about it. We spend an inordinate amount of time in a database obsessing over 90% of the people that have almost no income coming to us. Because we believe yeah, that's, that's what I wanted you to mention. Because really, uh, the database that, that is very time consuming, it is important and it is very time consuming, but it doesn't really bring 90% of revenue. It just takes probably 90% of your time. Uh, okay. But I do want to ask you a question that I think is pretty important. The new uh, style, new way of brokerage. Uh, so brokerages are changing right now. They are merging. Uh, there are different models and so on and so forth. Plus you have Zillow and CoStar uh, coming to MLS. So how do you see the development and how will it affect the traditional broker, realtor, uh, who, who is concerned probably that he doesn't, they don't need extra competition? Um, yeah, so I know you and I have sort of chatted a little bit about this sometimes in the past. Um, I, I kind of believe that we're looking at the wrong thing. And you know, we're always focused on the disruptors and the technology and all the stuff that's going to be, you know, it's like Zillow and CoStar and all that. They're, they're going to do what they're going to do, and that's fine. The thing that agents should be worried about that will change the, the pure landscape of how we operate in the business um, and, and brokerage on the whole are actually the lawsuits that are currently in existence right now. So the lawsuit between the Department of Justice and NAR, the three class action lawsuits uh, that are all around buyer agency, uh, commission structure, um, dual designated agency, um, and the Rex lawsuit against NAR as well. Like that's what agents should really be paying attention to. That should be the primary focus for an agent of understanding what's going to have the biggest impact on their business down the road. Because Zillow and CoStar, fine. People are still always going to need someone to help Sherpa them through the process of buying and selling a home. That's never going to change they can try and technologically disrupt elements of that. But the process of how I as an agent engage with somebody and facilitate that process, if any one of those lawsuits that are going through right now come to fruition, how that happens is going to change dramatically. And that will separate a tremendous amount of uh, how agents engage with people and how we operate in the business. It'll separate a large number of agents to the top of the pack and then a bunch that may not still be in the business anymore. I know a lot of people are like, well, there's a lot of agents that shouldn't be in the business. Sure, maybe that's true. But the reality of it is, is even the top 10% of agents will be deeply immediately affected by those lawsuits. Because if you change the fundamental structure of buyer agency, if you change commission structures, if you change, that opens Pandora's box for those disruptors to take full advantage of that stuff. So not to be, you know, not to terrify everybody during lunch, but learn, read, understand what these suits are about, understand what's going to happen with these things, because being prepared for what's coming and knowing how you can begin to get ahead of it. You know, a lot of what we work with right now is I'm not worried about those lawsuits because I know what would happen for me and the nature of my business and the people that I work with of how they'd still be insulated and secure no matter what happens with those lawsuits. But for a lot of agents, if they're not prepared, it's a problem. Yeah, and that is very important. That we don't really have time. I wanted to talk about crypto and how uh, crypto also terrifies agents. Uh, and uh, your answer was, uh, don't worry about crypto, but be aware. Oops, I think we lost you. No, I'm here. Kate's oh, just starting to here. Oh, here for oh, okay, us. Okay, double click. Okay, yeah, uh, here we go. Thank you, Kate. Um, yeah, and uh, I think that is also a very important point. Crypto is coming on board, regardless of whether we like it or not. However, we don't have to be terrified. We just have to be prepared. We have to learn what's out there in the market, right? And what is coming up and just get educated. Yeah, so uh, two, two quick thoughts for you there. Um, 
if you look at a real estate agent's database, right, only about 18% of all of the contacts that an agent has in their database have a home address on them. And yet, what do we do for a living? And you want to talk about crypto, the next future of financial transaction? I'm not worried about crypto yet. We'll get there. That'll be a thing. Right now, if you're buying and selling a home but don't know the person's address on where you actually go to get their information, we got bigger fish to fry and different problems that we got to be addressing down the long run. So crypto is cool. It'll be common. It'll be a thing. But slow and steady is going to win this race. Great. So do not invest in crypto today. No, no, no. You, you can still get it. I'm saying people want to learn. I'm all in favor of learning that. But don't worry about it too, too much. Well, thank you, Lance. Thank you, Lance, for everything. Uh, and it, it was it was fantastic. If you guys have any questions, that's the time to put them in the chat. Uh, meanwhile, I oh, so Lance has his phone number here. I, in the I chat. actually just dropped in there. I do a weekly text tip um, for anybody that wants it. All you have to do is just text me hello or hi at that number, and I'll get you set up. 